Today we have a special guest. Um, this is Don Casey, and he's from the Alliance for Citizens' Rights. He lives in Pleasant Grove, Alabama, and travels around the state and the southeast and the southeast, um, teaching people about Agenda 21, which is a UN initiative, a UN document, basically 300-page document, being implemented all over the United States, especially um, targeting county commissioners or county commissions, doing things at that level, down to the local level. And basically, in a nutshell, it's taking private property and giving it to the government or giving them control of our private property. Um, it is not a conspiracy. It is real. It is really happening. This is an issue you really need to understand. And they use a lot of different buzzwords like smart growth or sustainable development. It all sounds wonderful, but it happens to all lead to socialism and the government owning all the property and we're just little peons. They want to move us to the cities and population control and all that stuff. So he's going to give us a better understanding. He has a great presentation. This is his uh, co-worker, Ken Freeman, who also traveled up here with him. And they, they fight legislation. Just please welcome Don Casey. Thank you. As I'm uh, getting set up here, I'd like to make the comment that uh, we had a, a prayer among, amongst us, several of us, uh, that Becky led. And uh, she made the comment that we're uh, having this right after lunch and that we hope that we are able to hold the attention of the audience. Now, if there's a lightning bolt from somewhere and it hits somebody that maybe is nodding off, I may be leave the room very quickly. So I'm just letting you know. Uh, I just want to uh, set this up because I'm going to have a couple of slides that's going to more or less put my interpretation on the transition that we're currently under. Uh, and this is an organizational chart that actually came out of a, a book that was written by two school teachers back in the 1960s. Uh, it is a wonderful book that deals with the, uh, the constitutional history and the connection between Christianity and our Constitution uh, by Rosalie Slater and Verna Hall. If you happen to get a copy of it, that is where this particular slide came from. I had been reading a lot about the uh, French Revolution at the time and was trying to put all this together in my head and so this now has become the opening of the uh, presentation that you're about to see. And actually I really believe that this particular graphic lends itself to every society that man has created with the exception of one. Now the, uh, uh, all we have to do is just plug in the book of philosophical teaching, uh, then the code enforcement officer or the philosophical person that's authorized to uh, uh, enforce the teaching that's recognized by society and then of course the governmental uh, representative. Now in this particular situation I put the, the Bible in the book of philosophical teaching of course the uh, Church of England or, or any one of the churches of, of Europe would have enforced the teaching. Uh, there was a coronation where, and this is actually a religious ceremony where the authorized church leader would anoint the king uh, in, in its religious ceremony, and it goes all the way back to the Old Testament. So truly this is a, a partnership between church and state. Uh, today we would call that particular uh, situation or condition a governance system, a public-private partnership, and if you listen for the word governance, you'll hear it in place of government. Now the actual definition for governance is not government, it is the uh, framework of rules, institution, and practices that set limits on behavior. Very important. Sets limits on the behavior of individuals, organizations, and companies. Now this is a, intended to be, when it's fully implemented, a self-regulated system. Going to the other end of this spectrum, all the way from of course, uh, you could have any number of different kinds of religion from Christianity all the way to atheism. I happened to pick Stalin. He enforced the atheistic creed in his society. Uh, so I thought that that was very appropriate. Now, in, I don't know if you happen to see the History Channel, but uh, when Stalin came to power, he required that, if I can get this to operate here, he required that um, the, the pictures of 
or religious icons be taken off the wall in every home and it was burned of course and replaced by a portrait of himself truly this became a situation where Stalin became a god for the people uh, it, it is quite different from our system of government where we we are really the only ones that does do have uh, a uh, separation of church and state now here is you know, of course the one exception to that and you'll notice that the individual uh, is is under God's word and responsible to God. In the other system, you'll notice that the individual is responsible to the entities created by the church and state, and as such, he, his lead, uh, freedom and liberty are limited. This one produced liberty and freedom. It is a self-limited self-government system. It's the only one that's been created that I know of in the history of mankind. Uh, we are endowed by our Creator with certain unalienable rights. And it's really our belief that Jefferson wanted to have that hyphenated because no entity created by man has the authority to place a lien against that which God has given you. So this is a very a different situation if you look at the French Revolution and all of the documents that come forward from that first communist revolution all the way into the United Nations documents. They use the word inalienable. And inalienable in a legal dictionary means those rights which the possessor can give away. Unalienable rights are those rights which God has granted you and you do not have the right or authority to give them away. And of course the history of man is replete with uh, instances of those rights being abridged by government entities. Self-government has occurred once in the history of man and if we lose it, I dare say in my grandchildren's time, it will not be replaced. Justice, now if we have time and, and you want to go through how justice, how system uh, that we have allows justice to exist and it's actually a negative concept. Uh, we're the only one that allows justice to exist. In the other situation with um, the precautionary principle, government is intended to be proactive and, and, and of course in that situation justice cannot exist. Also under the system that we have, uh, God created church the family and government and as long as they operate within their spheres of influence it, we have that that freedom and liberty that we so cherish in this country in this other situation government faith-based initiative and by the way George Bush started the faith-based initiative Obama has greatly increased the monetary uh, rewards for that organization non-governmental organizations and corporations corporations are over 200 uh, corporations, and if you're taking notes, and I hope you do, go home and look up the World Business Council on Sustainable Development. Over 200 of the world's largest corporations have already adopted sustainable development, so they're in the process of working with government and work with faith-based faith initiatives in order to bring this about. And again, it is intended to be a self-regulating governance system. Now this is a slide that I put together after having read this for a number of years. <clears throat> and it's my opinion that the uh, enthusiasts for this particular ideology really believe that it's a religion. Uh, they adhere to it much like the uh, people in the 1930s. It is a progressive socialist system. Uh, of course, Agenda 21 is a uh, milestone along this path, certainly not the, the genesis of it, but it is a, uh, a well-worthy uh, document to note along the path towards the ultimate goal of socialism. In 2002, uh, the United States submitted a report to the UN, UN. All this is voluntary. None of this is in secret. You can go to the United Nations website and, and pull up a database, and every country that has adopted sustainable development has agreed to submit on a five-year basis reports detailing how this country has uh, adopted and spent money, appropriated money in various areas, working with different organizations across the country to implement this. Uh, this was um, uh, the, 19, the 2002, it is 156 pages long. Uh, it is well worth the time and effort to go out and look and see what organizations are listed in this particular document. 
Next is the World Summit on Sustainable Development. Now, of course, George Bush, went, 41st President of the United States, went to Rio and signed the document. This is the 2002 conference, which was held in celebration of that signing. It is also a look forward in, into what can be done and what needs to be done, excuse me, in order to implement this. So now, the next nine slides are automated and hopefully everything's going to work right and you're going to be able to hear it and not be blown out in the front and barely hear it in the back. But you're going to see uh, seven photographs that are going to scroll across the screen and you're going to hear a, a supposed wise man stand on the podium or on the stage where the opening ceremony was held at this conference and he's going to describe what is wrong with the earth. Then you're going to hear Colin Powell say that you and I and uh, the American people in general have a enduring commitment, along with President Bush, the 43rd President of the United States, to sustainable development. Life began with an egg, then came the plant, the animals, and finally the human being. Yes, we are all children of Mother Earth. That is why we must take care of her and beat her with the lips. She is the hand that feeds us and the heart that heals us. But I say to say, we are failing. Greed and foolishness are eating deep into the fabric of humankind. We are failing to love and care for Mother Earth. Well, that was, of course, the national and international scene, and that was 2002. And so we've made some progress in implementing this particular program. Uh, last June, there was a hearing uh, held in Washington, D.C., where the National Association of County Commissioners, uh, the representative of that group, who actually was at the time a county commissioner for Carroll County, County Maryland, made a uh, presentation to the uh, committee. And so now what you're about to see is five minutes of her testimony. In the middle of her testimony, you're going to hear her make the comment that local government determines growth, development, and livability. Now that is not determined by the individual, but that is determined by the tenets of sustainable development. So uh, also at the end, she's going to reference 100,000 acres that is set aside in her county. That was a goal. Later on in the, in the uh, program today, you'll see why she was referencing that. And by the way, while this is coming up, it takes about 24 seconds. Uh, Shelby is well aware of this program. He has been apprised of it several occasions. He has spoke, not spoken about it at all. He has not commented at all. He bears more responsibility, in my opinion, than does Senator Dodd, who is a proponent of this. As far as I'm concerned, if you know about this and you don't speak about it, you bear responsibility. NACO is the only national organization representing America's 3,068 counties, supports the Liberals Community Act to provide incentive grants to local areas for regional planning around housing, transportation, environment, energy, land use, and health initiatives. Last year, NACO passed a resolution supporting your legislation. Rural, suburban, and urban counties have been pursuing local strategies to create livable communities and implement sustainable development for decades. NACO has worked to support our members in achieving sustainable development for more than 15 years through assistance on issues including smart growth and planning, sustainable economic development, and business retention. Priorities now include clean energy development and disaster recovery. In 2007, NACO began the Green Government Initiative, providing comprehensive resources for local governments on all things green. Planning for sustainable communities is by nature a regional effort, whether individually with neighboring jurisdictions or through regional
regional councils, counties have the primary role in planning and economic development decisions impacting and determining growth, development, and livability. Many rural and mid-sized counties would like to begin sustainable planning and development, but lack the resources to do so. The grants would be available to meet the needs of the counties to begin the process for sustainable development or for implementation, which is why this legislation is so very important. <coughs> Carroll County, Maryland has a population of 175,000. We have created three LEED certified green buildings, which are oriented for site costume and lighting and solar control, extensive stormwater management, geothermal systems, and the use of high recycled content materials. To reduce our carbon footprint, we invested in the purchase of hybrid cars for our fleet, as well as hybrid vans for our transportation system within Carroll County. <clears throat> Carroll County also participates in the energy management initiative provided through partnership with the Baltimore Metropolitan Council, or the BMC. <laughs> We are an active participant on the Regional Sustainable Council of the BMC, promoting coordinated policies amongst regional districts and jurisdictions uh, to adopt alternative energy and sustainable plans. To preserve our rural history, we implemented an installment purchase plan uh, for farm preservation, and this allows us to purchase development rights by leveraging our money so more land can be purchased at today's prices. To date, we have placed over 60,000 acres into permanent preservation on our farm. And our goal is 100,000 acres, which is one third of our county. NACO continues to believe sustainability should encourage through a federal grant program, rewarding regions and communities undertaking sustainable programs. NACO believes all communities should be eligible for the program and we support funds being set aside for a subcategory of all rural areas. Efforts at local and regional planning are hindered when federal funds are not granted to local, directly to local government. <coughs> NACO appreciates the bill allows counties to receive the funding directly, and I think that's most important. And so today I do thank you for the opportunity to testify um, we appreciate the opportunity, Chairman Dodd, and look forward to working with you. Well, thank you very, very much. And, uh, your, your timing of your testimony was perfect. Now, we took that five-minute video and put it on a DVD, and we have copies in the back, and I would hope that everyone would be interested enough to get a copy, share it with everyone that you know. Uh, we also went and got the... Um, uh, 2010 legislative agenda for the uh, Alabama Association of County Commissioners. Now, uh, at the time we, we uh, got a copy of it, the 2011 agenda was not out. But there are 11 new taxes that the County Commissioner Association wants to levy on the rural areas. One of the highlights that I like to point out is that they want to have an internal revenue service operating under the auspices of the County Commission. Uh, this group goes to Montgomery and lobbies for the, the tenants of sustainable development on our dime. They can be de defunded, and in my opinion, they should be defunded. Uh, because they are carrying out the, the very tenets. The, you, you go and look at the association's connection to the National Association of County Commissioners, and it's quite clear that they're, they're lobbying for the very same tenets that, are, that this uh, Carroll County, Maryland, uh, commissioner was talking about. Now, the great news is, is that when the people in Carroll County, Maryland, found out exactly what was going on this past fall, every one of the county commissioners was voted out. And those new county commissioners are now going around uh, talking about sustainable development openly, uh, and they have done away with uh, many of the, the programs that were set up by the prior commission. So it's just a question of making the public aware of what's going on, uh, and we can, if we will, get off our collective duff, uh, turn this around. So now let me go on with, uh, oh, and this is, uh, by the way, uh, it, from this uh, Livable Communities Act, 
there was, which did pass, by the way, uh, there was a grant made to the East Alabama Regional Planning Commission, and this particular uh, document is a handout, so I want you to get a copy of it. Uh, the East Alabama Regional Planning Commission uh, says in this abstract of their plan where they received $225,000 from the federal government to institute sustainable development in various communities in this area, uh, and by the way, it, it is not this specific area, but it, the abstract says that the East Alabama Regional Planning Commission is going to work with other regional planning commissions in Alabama to bring about sustainable development. And one of the sentences in this particular document says we're going to overcome obstacles to sustainable development. So uh, we, we may have a polite confrontation with people that want to institute socialism in our society. Now let me get back to um, the, the, the uh, slides that you're going to see from now on because most of them have, were created by me. Uh, the top half, of course, gets back to the religion that I believe this to be. The bottom half is from the UK, the United Kingdom, uh, and it is designed to teach teachers that are going to teach the tenets of sustainable development. And you'll notice the, the, th the three circles. Uh, one represents environment, social, economy, and where those three circles come together, it is said that sustainable development is occurring. Notice that knowledge, understanding, skills, attitudes, values, and behaviors are reflected in the actions of the students that take this course. Also, that this goes uh, from, see, what did I do with my, oh, there it is. It goes uh, from local to global. There's no national government. And if you look at ICLAE, the International Council on Local Envir Environmental Initiatives, and by the way, they've been kicked out of a number of local communities just recently. Uh, they try to come in, or do come in, and they partner with local communities to set up various regulations and ordinances at the local level, and this really does bypass the national and state level, instituting the global plan at the local level. And if you want a, uh, another word, a buzzword, actually, that you can look up, and I just put this on the top, it's globalization. So if you want to do a little more homework and, and look this particular word up, you'll see how this is being applied uh, globally. So now here are all of these, uh, or the predominant uh, number of slides from now on, are going to be from proponents of sustainable development. And this one I like to call the wheel of sustainable development. Uh, all roads lead to Rome and all aspects of your life lead to sustainable development. We really should have uh, pastors to begin to teach about this from the pulpit. Uh, it is a, a very important aspect. If you uh, have the ear of your pastor, please bring this to his attention. Now I'm going to use this slide to divide the rest of the presentation into various components of the wheel of sustainable development. Uh, I want to pick up on social health and food policy. The food policy was uh, a new subject to me about a year ago. Uh, just happened to run into some information about it, but it is a component of sustainable development. And here is from Clackamas County, Oregon, the Green Ribbon Committee. And notice that we have a bullseye with the urban center in the middle. And then surrounding that is the Metropolitan Food Shed. It is intended that all food that is consumed in the urban center is grown in the Metropolitan Food Shed. Any food that comes from outside that Metropolitan Food Shed would have to have a tariff placed on it. And your ecological footprint would have to be measured in order to ensure that you have enough credits to purchase it. You, with any of these programs, you're going to have new words and phrases. This is locavore. Um, I had no idea that, that this concept even existed, and I was talking to a, a student at uh, UAB, and he said, oh, I, actually, I am a local for, so <laughs> I've, I've uh, met some people. Now, these are uh, two magazines that had articles in them dealing with local for, and if you'll notice, uh, the individual that went out to harvest the food, and by the way, local, local for merely means that you uh, agree to buy or purchase food within 100 miles of your home. So this individual has not degraded the earth or sinned against Mother Earth. He has used a bicycle to go out and harvest his uh, daily sustenance. Uh, so he's, he's got a plus on his uh, triple bottom line, as you'll find out a little later on. 
Food miles is the distance that the food travels, and this is a, a poster that's actually intended for school children. And with each uh, means of transportation, there is some degrading of the earth or some sin against the earth, and the child is taught that he should care. That's the, probably the most important part is that we should have feelings towards the earth. We don't want to desecrate Mother Earth. Food policy councils, uh, and one of the first things that will happen after an or, uh, organization like this is formed, by the way, we have one that's being formed up right now in Alabama, uh, they will fight, uh, create a food charter. Now, uh, a food charter would have certain tenets of it. This one says the, the term food citizenship is defined as the practice of engaging in food-related behaviors. And if you'll recall, we saw that food behaviors or behaviors was right here in this uh, uh, program where we teach children and our actions must be reflected. Our behaviors must be conforming to sustainable development. So now let me pick up on the rest of this particular uh, quote. The food citizenship is defined as the practice of engaging in food related behaviors that support rather than threaten the development of a democratic, socially and economically just and environmentally sustainable food system. So the whole point here that I want to bring out for social health is, is that you, if you don't support it, you're threatening. So there's actually no sitting on the fence. You're going to endorse these programs or you're going to be, have demerits put on your uh, list. Now this next quote says that food democracy or food citizenship recognizes that consumers can identify the interest of other food workers, other consumers, future generations, and other species. So now that concept right there with the future generations and other species is species equity and intergenerational equity, meaning that everything has to be equal across many generations looking forward. If you use a gallon of gas, remember the guy was using a bicycle to go out and get his, his uh, supper, if you use a gallon of gas, you are depleting the resources for future generations, and you're not having, you, you have not established intergenerational equity if you do that. Now, the important aspect of this particular quote is that this was an individual at Drexel University that presented this in a, her doctoral thesis. So she is expecting that the ivory tower of education has already accepted this concept and she is trying to play to their sympathies looking for her doctorate. This one is from uh, uh, King County um, in Seattle uh, promoting a food system for healthier people. You know, uh, uh, Mrs. Obama is always promoting the healthier food system. Well, this is exactly what we're talking about. And this was actually presented to the nutritional experts or professionals in the area. And the title of this particular PowerPoint presentation is Sustainable Food Systems, Your Role as the Nutrition Expert. Now, one of the um, tenets or goals of this is that social and environmental justice from seed to table. In other words, when you put the seed in the table, the farm worker has to be socially just. Every aspect of his employment, of his life, has got to be socially just. When it's transported to your table, it has to be environmentally just. So that's a goal from seed to table to ensure that this, this policy is carried forward. Food charter. Now, when I uh, first saw this, and let me... Uh, pick this up and I'm going to go over just one paragraph of this particular document. And by the way, this is a handout so when you uh, get ready to leave, make sure you get a copy of it. Uh, food uh, security. I, I really thought that uh, security for you know, my appetite and my, uh, uh, at my home would be that if I've got a refrigerator full of food, I, I don't have any problem with food security. But that's not what food security actually means. Uh, it is a uh, means or a situation in which the community residents are able to obtain safe, culturally acceptable, nutritionally adequate diet through a sustainable food system that maximizes community self-reliance and social justice. So now just commenting on some of the, the tenets of this, if you had a group of people that were not of your ethnic background or culturally acceptable, I would imagine you may have to have some food shipped in in order to satisfy their culturally acceptable food palate. Um, 
and there are several other tenants on there that uh, deal with uh, social justice that I've highlighted that I won't go over, but it, it would bear uh, your attention to take a look at them. Now, we've talked about social justice a good bit, so I went out and got a definition of social justice, and here it is. It is a progressive system of taxation, income redistribution, property redistribution, equality of opportunity, and equality of outcome. So that's actually what we're talking about when we talk about sustainable seed, and putting it in the ground and everything associated with it has to fall under these specific categories. So, in Alabama we've already had three food summits. Now this, and I didn't pull it out of my case, but I have a weekly newspaper and this is on the front of that weekly newspaper from 2009 and this is the poster that they floated in advertising this. Um, we've had one uh, of these summits in, in, in not Montgomery, but Dothan, and we've had two in Birmingham. So now, uh, in an effort to explain what the food policy actually does, uh, Ken and I got together and created a, a flyer uh, that explains sustainable agriculture. Now, typically what's going to happen is, is that the food policy, and if you go to the Alabama Sustainable Agricultural Network, and there are websites up on the, the net, you will find that they are asking for volunteers to come forward and join on the Food Policy Council. They will write the food policy statement, uh, and they will begin to go to Montgomery and lobby for uh, organic food. Sounds wonderful. In fact, what is going to happen and what is already happening in sustainable forestry initiative that Alabama has signed into is that the small farmer uh, is going to be cut out because he won't be able to adhere to the BMPs, the best management practices that are required. He is committing suicide by adopting these practices. It will only be big ag that will be able to adhere to all of the BMPs that come down from on high uh, and it won't be long and we'll see a, a tremendous escalation in the price of food. Um, there was uh, something, uh, another comment, and maybe I, I might come back to it I, right now, I just, I've got a singer moment. Uh, so at any rate, if I do remember it, I'll come back to it. Uh, the Alabama Rural Electric Association has a magazine, uh, and in this particular issue of the magazine, the dean of the university's College of Agriculture, Mr. Bill Batchelor, uh, had an article. In the very first sentence of that article said, food security, renewable energy, and environmental sustainability are issues that affect everyone. So, Here's another magazine. This is Cooperative Farming News, coming to grips with sustainable development. Uh, and in this particular article, it references your uh, ecological footprint, the very same the carbon footprint. It's all wrapped up in the, kind of the same concept. And in this article, it talks about what farmers are encouraged to do currently. Currently, we want to have, um, oh, and by the way, let me, let me point out, this is a, a particular important aspect, resource flows and pollution flows, and we'll see a quote about that in just a minute. Now, here it says that future versions of the ecological survey that will, are determined, uh, or are used to determine your, ec your ecological footprint, uh, will include, uh, or currently include, corn, soybeans, wheat, cotton, and that the indicators are going to be written at a later date to ensure water quality, biodiversity, ecosystem services, and economic and social matters. So we're, we're, it's like the seatbelt law was volunteer, and now it's mandatory. So we voluntarily are asking for farmers to go in and fill this out, and later on this article says we're going to have social matters wrapped up into this. So now let me pick up on another subject. Let me go to uh, freedom of choice, social health, and transportation. Now, <clears throat> this, this particular document is online. I actually have a hard copy of it. It is Under Construction Tools and Techniques for Local Planning. This is a document published by the state of Minnesota. It is not something that anyone from our opinion or our uh, side of this fence has written. And on page 73, it actually has 
the definition for freedom of choice, and I'm sure that you would have some uh, preconceived concept of what freedom of choice means, but it means that people should be able to choose where they live and do business as long as they pay the identifiable cost of those choices and do, do not impose unaccounted for cost on other people or nature now or in the future. So again, we're talking about intergenerational equity and species equity. So what we're actually going to have to do is we're going to have to identify and compensate disadvantaged human beings, other species, current and future generations of human and other species. So now, what is transportation for? I always thought it was just a means that I got from point A to point B. This is introduction to uh, transportation. It is not an end in itself. It is merely a means by which we support individual and collective goals and objectives. Clearly a socialist concept that we have collective goals dealing with transportation. So now here is a quote from the transportation funding options for the state of South Carolina, 2003 to, to uh, 2022, and it says that equity issues include income distribution, urban, rural, and regional geographic differences, and intergenerational equity, or concerns as they put it. Here now is chapter uh, 40, uh, just this is actually chapter uh, 40.4, of Agenda 21, and you recall the graphics that we had up here with the resource flows and the uh, pollution flows. And it says commonly used indicators such as gross national product and measurements of individual resource flows or pollution flows do not provide adequate indications of sustainability. This was 1992. Didn't have the computer system that would be self-regulating to determine individual resource extraction or flows and pollution flows. So now, at some, the, the next question kind of clarifies it. Indicators of sustainable development need to be developed. We need to work towards this development of these uh, abilities to measure those flows in order to determine at all level to, uh, and create a self-regulating sustainable system. So now let me talk about vehicle miles traveled. Anybody hear of that? It's, it's, okay, one, uh, uh, two people. It, it's actually been in the news, three. Uh, very recently, it was on Sean Hannity and several other of the uh, economic uh, shows, on, on several shows that I happen to watch. And it means the, the miles that you travel. And basically, uh, and I'm just going to cut to the, the chase here, the computer is going to transmit to the pump the uh, where you were and when you were there, the pump then will access various databases that you have interacted with. If you go to the grocery store and swipe your little card, uh, you're gonna uh, that information is held in a database. If you purchase food from outside your food shed, then the computer will automatically create a a value for how much. Uh, you're going to have to pay for that gasoline. If you've driven through an area where there are endangered species, you have degraded the environment for the future generations and current generations, so it would automatically assign a value that you will have to pay for that gasoline. Now that's, that's where we're going. Now let me add to that, now of course this is from, this particular document is from Nevada, uh, and this was phase one, there's three phases to this. Uh, and the green states are states that are currently looking at adopting a VMT type of tax. Uh, now, I was also looking at the University of North Carolina. Uh, they have an urban institute and they have divided the disadvantage into subgroups. So now, we, we, just, we just don't have a classification for one group of disadvantaged people. Here, here are what they determined. Uh, the elderly over 75, the physically disabled, carless households, low-income households, female head of households with children, then we have limited proficient persons, we have Hispanic and Latino groups, and we have non-Hispanic minorities. Now consider if you have subgroups of disadvantaged people that have to have equity applied to them in order to make everything equal across the board, you would have advantage groups and that advantage group would then be subdivided into other types of groups. So I can see at some point some 
uh, socialist planner going wild with this kind of information and dividing the groups and setting up a database that assigns a certain value for certain types of people, groups of people. Uh, there's no end to this, uh, actually, if you put the mind of uh, imagination of man to it. So I thought it was kind of interesting to pick up on some of the um, uh, logo that you'll run into on the internet uh, dealing with sustainable development. Uh, the Earth Rights Institute um, is up on the far left there. Uh, they are encouraging the adoption of the Pledge of Allegiance to the Earth, and in a few minutes you'll see that Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, they also, if, I don't know if you have to notice it, but Brazil has also uh, endorsed uh, a, a program or tenets of this that would recognize rights for the Earth. So uh, the Earth Rights Institute uh, it would be also supporting that. Type in any college, any university you want to, and sustainable development in parentheses, and you'll wind up with logo. So that's what I did, and I wound up with this one on Vanderbilt University. Uh, this one is Lipscomb University, and I really I had no idea that Lipscomb was a uh, church-supported support, school. They're down the street from Vanderbilt University. They're supported by the, uh, the Church of Christ, uh, and I am uh, uh, friends uh, for a long period of time with uh, some very prominent people in the Church of Christ in my area, and I was very surprised to find that they have the Institute for Sustainable Practices and that Mr. Galbraith is the executive director. Now, the reason I have this here is because Mr. Galbraith has been involved in helping Holenwall in Lewis County, Tennessee, transform itself into a sustainable community. So I wanted to make that point. And, and at some point, I'm, I'm hoping to meet with some of the individuals uh, that are movers and shakers in this university. I have been promised that. I don't know that that will happen, but certainly look forward to it at some point. Uh, of course, other logos. This is uh, Campus Sustainability. They held a six-day conference, Association of uh, Community Colleges. This is the next most recognized logo. This is the three-legged stool. Each leg represents one aspect of sustainable development. Uh, then we have the Elmore County Comprehensive Plan. This is the proposed comprehensive plan. It was not adopted by the County Commission. Uh, there was uh, some controversy over this, and the County Commission decided not to adopt it. But it did have, in fact, the most recognized definition for sustainable development in the comprehensive plan and discussed it uh, in several paragraphs. Now, this uh, gentleman right here is the mayor of Eufaula, Alabama. They are the first recognized sustainable community in Alabama, and he's drawing those same three circles on a dry erase report. Now, the bottom half of this particular slide is, is bolstering my point, I think, in making the point that this is indeed a, a religion. Because this is the Ark of uh, Hope. It is designed to be a copy of the Ark of the Covenant. It was made out of one tree in Germany, shipped over to the New England states, and it was carried down to the meditation room in the United Nations and resided there for several months. Now, it had in, the, one of the contents of this was the Earth Charter. And here is what Mikhail Gorbachev had to say about that. He said, my hope is that the Charter will be a kind of Ten Commandments, uh, a Sermon on the Mount, that will provide a guide for human behavior toward the environment in the next generation. So I, 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 again, I'm making this, this is a philosophy, a religion that's been adopted by leaders, and we're basically unaware that this has occurred already. Now, this is the pledge of uh, allegiance to the earth, uh, and I'm gonna may have to adjust the volume.
Well, you can certainly see that the parents were enthusiastic about this, and there's one thing that Lincoln did say that's absolutely true. What is taught in the schools of today is tomorrow's reality. Their reality is not our reality. I am of the group that believe in private property rights and freedom and liberty based on God's principle. I dare say that uh, we need more young people in this room, and we need to teach them the opposite of what is being taught here. Uh, let me now pick up on Tennessee's uh, first transition initiative. Uh, they are going to use permaculture to move to sustainable development. By the way, sustainable development is never stagnant. Uh, it is a, a ladder that is continuous. Once you obtain one rung of that ladder, you've got another rung staring you in the face. Permaculture is big enough to have a magazine of its own. It is a worldwide movement. Uh, it is the combination, permaculture is the combination of two words, permanent agriculture. So in essentially, Holinwall, Tennessee uh, and um, Lewis County are saying that they want to remain permanently agricultural with no service-based industry or industry at all. Uh, it is quite amazing that people would openly adopt a, a program like this. Um, now this is a proclamation, it's actually signed, um, and by the way it's also a handout, um, and the uh, county officials of, Holland, of Lewis County and all of the uh, officials of Holinwall, the county seat, actually signed this document. It is, in my opinion, rather revealing. And it says that whereas the emphasis of local sustainability in every sector of society can only occur as the individual commit themselves to exemplifying those practices in their personal lives and inspiring others to do the same. So now this is, this is an official document. That's one reason I picked up on Holinwall and used it as an example because there are other examples of transition communities across the country. Now one of the first things that this particular uh, town did and county did was to create a time dollar system. There are over 200 of these kinds of systems already going on in the United States. They go by different names and I've just listed a few of them. Um, if you're as old as I am uh, you're, you and grew up in and around the steel industry or coal industry, um, you certainly are aware of script. And I would imagine most everyone in here remembers Tennessee Ernie Ford and his song, You Load 16 Tons and What Do You Get? One Day Older and Deeper in Debt. And St. Peter, don't call me because everything I own belongs to the company store. Now, what is happening in Holinwall, Tennessee, was a three month experiment to issue script. It would be accepted by all of the merchants in the community for that period of time. There was some uh, controversy in that some stores would give U.S. currency as change and some others wouldn't, uh, but the currency is not any good beyond the boundary of that community. It is the same thing uh, that I, I watched as I grew up uh, around the steel industry and coal mining. So this is uh, going to be used uh, as a lifesaver for the uh, the, the system that we're currently in because obviously the dollar is being uh, tanked. It's, it's going to be worthless uh, soon. I would imagine we'll have the same kind of inflation that Germany had after World War I and there'll be people will be scrambling trying to maintain the wealth that they have accumulated in their life. I can well understand that but this is not the system that it is intended to uh, maintain your wealth in any form or fashion. So uh, let me uh, now uh, show you a short clip. Uh, this was uh, filmed at the official recognition where Holen Wall uh, came out and said we are a sustainable uh, community and we are moving through permaculture to, to obtain that. You're going to hear the vice mayor, a very young man, stand and say, oh, we are so proud to uh, be recognized as one of the few on the East Coast moving towards uh, sustainability. Then you're going to hear a, 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 a woman that's probably in her 50s, she's, an old, uh, she's a school teacher but she was at one time a cheerleader and she's cheering everybody on. She's so excited to be at, at this particular situation uh, and, and uh, this celebration and she's going to say uh, I adopted uh, this program and accepted it because of principles when they told me the two principles and she's going to name those two principles. After she gets through we're going to look at what she didn't say.
United States. Transition town has been deployed only the fourth on the East Coast, which is also nowhere. So we're proud of that. We've reached the common goal. It's a very common goal that they have to act. Well, of course, I hope you noticed that she said care of the earth's people. That was not an um, accident. Uh, it is the first two principles of uh, permaculture, and I went out to the website for permaculture, and now what you're about to see is from their website, and these are the principles that she neglected to comment on. Of course, the first one that she did say was care of the earth and care of the earth's people. The next one is accepting limits to population and consumption. That's a tenet of Agenda 21, Sustainable Development. Next one belongs, uh, the Earth belongs to our ecosystem and Gaia. Humanity belongs to the Earth and our ecosystem and Gaia. And, and Gaia is, is a, a religious reference to Mother Earth. Uh, next, the problem is not humanity. The problem is our culture, our growth, and how we make a living. The old world view. Now, this is what she contends the old world view was. 2,000 years ago, our ancestors created a world in which, uh, or w which taught that humanity is flawed, we are sinners, and the earth is a proving ground to uh, see whether we are worthy to go to a better place when we die. Well, of course, my contention is, what else did that old world view teach? And that was in the very first slide. It taught that we have unalienable rights granted to us by a creator, this is the only system that's ever been created, and, and we have liberty and freedom because of what the people did in the 1700s. Now, the new set of ethics, this is what she wants to instill in Hohenwall in Lewis County, Tennessee. All profits, losses, and fines are shared equally. Decisions are made by consensus. Private property leads to hoarding and is a disincentive to sharing, and it should be eliminated. All non-household assets should also be communal or part of the commons. These ethics translate into making a living in a way that does not participate in the destruction of the earth. So now you get an idea of that, I, you know, if, if I think that if the audience knew what she was actually referring to, she would not be long lived in the town. Uh, she would have an escort out. So now let me pick up on the, the next, next aspect of this particular wheel of sustainability and social health and sustainable development. 
Uh, and this goes back to the Bush administration. This is 2003, and this is um, uh, Bosworth. He was director in 2003 under the Bush administration, director of the USDA. And this is a verbatim a copy of his speech. And he, he was talking about the National Report on Sustainable Forests. USDA and all other federal agencies have to produce reports uh, on a regular basis determining how that agency is spending the money to move towards sustainable development. And here now he's talking about these reports that are required under the executive branch of all the federal agencies. He says we also need to know how the biological condition relates to our economy and society. In other words, sustainability depends on how social, economic, and ecological components interrelate. And the idea has become so important that it's earned its own name. And that name is the triple bottom line. So now go home and type, down, type into any search engine you want to, the triple bottom line. And by the way, these slides that you'll see after this, all I did was type in triple bottom line, PPT for PowerPoint presentation and sustainable development. And these are the slide uh, from proponents of this particular program and what they thought about it. Now, this next one, of course, is not the three circles or the... <coughs> the uh, three-legged stool, but we have a triangle, uh, three sides economy, society, and environment, and of course rising up out of that is happiness. Uh, and that is the basis for the triple bottom line. And it says to be sustainable, a society must satisfy the requirements of the triple bottom line. They're, they're requirements, folks. They're not uh, optional. Uh, however, that alone is not sufficient. The feelings of people living in society are also important. Even if the triple bottom line requirements are satisfied, society, society is not sustainable if people feel unhappy. Therefore, we define the sustainable society as one that satisfies the triple bottom line requirements and makes you feel happy. So now the rest of this PowerPoint presentation gets into what would make you feel happy. Uh, and I think when you see that a universal health care system is one of those, you'll, you'll recognize that as something that's already been instituted. Uh, and this slide takes each one of this ladder of sustainability and goes through it and explains it. This one just happens to be health care. Now the GSF stands for social, a gross social feel-good index. So now we want to have a, a survey of the community uh, and determine who's happy and who's not happy. Are you happy with your food citizenship? Uh, have you gone your food mile? You know, it just goes on and on and on. So now let me pick up on land use planning um, and the greening of development. This, of course, would be your local comprehensive plan. Uh, most communities uh, across the entire country have already adopted um, the land, uh, comprehensive plan. That is official policy. It holds the tenets of sustainable development. Uh, the, in communities that have not, uh, typically, in, uh, especially in Coleman, uh, there was a controversy raised over the comprehensive plan, and we participated in that, and so the plan was not adopted. Uh, but that, it's still on the website. It's still out there that you can read it, and the community or the elected officials are still instituting various ordinances to bring about the tenets of sustainable development. Uh, the graining of uh, development, of course, oh, uh, one other point I want to make up about um, uh, communities. The international building codes uh, is all part of this, and that has been adopted in every community I've looked at. Wetumpka, I know, uh, not Wetumpka, Tallahassee has already adopted. As a matter of fact, they adopted all 14 volumes, uh, and there were individuals that uh, went and brought that to the attention of the elected officials, and they rescinded some of them. But uh, these international building codes are revised every three years. California is currently participating with Canada to revise the new building codes that will be put out uh, in order to in, uh, incorporate green aspects and sustainable development within the new set of principles. So if you adopt them this year, uh, six years, nine years down the road, you're going to be adopting a new set of principles and incorporating that and requiring all your businesses to now uh, adopt all this. Um, uh, one uh, interesting example that I ran into was in uh, Talladega where there was a blockbuster building uh, or blockbuster went out of business, man bought the building, wanted to put in a, um, a gymnasium. 
Uh, as it turned out, they had already adopted the international building codes. They had to go in and strip out all of the good fluorescent lights and come in and put green fluorescent lights. It stopped him cold. He could not put the business uh, up because he couldn't afford to renovate the building under the new uh, the uh, lighting requirements. So now also the biodiversity treaty. This would also go into climate change treaty also. There's two, actually two treaty. I just only have the, the one, the biodiversity treaty that deals with land use planning and uh, the greening development. Now, <clears throat> this particular slide is actually, our slide cell presentation was created by the EPA, Region 4 out of Atlanta. This is talking about the southeastern ecological framework. Uh, this is old information. This has been out there for a while. The uh, University of uh, uh, Florida and Tallahassee hosted uh, and still host all of the information dealing with the southeastern ecological framework. They participated in the program along with the Department of Transportation in mapping the seven southeastern states. Now this biodiversity treaty in essence asked for 50 percent of the continental United States be set aside for animals, a 10 percent buffer zone, and the 40 percent remaining landmass is where we will be encouraged Con, uh, conjoled, enticed to move into through different regulations. And if you go look at what the Association of County Commissioners wants to do to the rural area, it will be extremely in, uh, 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 high dollar living in the rural area. Ten dollars a gallon of gasoline, which is not unheard of. Certainly five dollars is making it very untenable for some people, but if you add new taxes and other things to the rural area, it will be untenable to reside in those areas. So now, uh, this southeastern ecological framework has a, a PowerPoint presentation. This is another slide. These are the federal agencies that are participating in this program. And now here is the one slide that basically explains what I just said. We have one hub. Uh, that is 5,000 acres or larger. All hubs are 5,000 acres or larger. They're dark green. They have, and this should, really should be a green instead of a blue. Uh, this would be called an interconnecting corridor. Uh, and, the, and the philosophy behind this says that we want an animal to be able to migrate from this hub through that interconnecting corridor all the way over to this hub so that their gene pool does not degrade over the next thousand years. <laughs> now that, that, that is, I, I realize that, and, and, and honestly, it, it, while it may sound humorous, I know that people laughed about Hitler in the 30s. He was no joke. The, these people are spending our money hand over fist as fast as they can to institute this. The, this is, you recall the, the Carroll County Commissioner talked about 100,000 acres to be set aside. Well, that's exactly what she was setting aside. It, is, it was just one program of many uh, to bring this all about. Now, re uh, remember that we want to make sure that uh, this, this bluish green area is the buffer zone so that they don't come in contact with any human, be any human being or, or interfered with in any way by any activity that man may have. So now this, if you want to go and look the website up where the interactive maps actually reside. This is the National Biological Infrastructure website. This is, and if, uh, it's a little bit hard to find because there's many uh, things on this particular website, but this is the maps uh, of the region of the southeastern states. And this is actually Elmore County right here, Coosa, Tallapoosa, and uh, Macon County. And you can see how much green area the, the real faint light green area is PEAs or SEAs, which stands for Priority Ecological Area or uh, Significant Ecological Area. They, they also would be part of the hub and inter interconnecting corridors. So now, um, does every, it, how many people are familiar with Forever Wild? Wait a minute, Don. Back oh, up. Back up. Okay. The, the dark green area are totally human free. Those are the core areas. The medium green area is highly regulated buffer zone and the whiter area that still has light green swatches in it, that's where people are going to be allowed to live. Now all of the dark green and the medium green are going to be taken out of the tax base and taken out of productive land so that it will belong to the animals basically. 
And that's what your county is going to look like when they get done carving it up according to Agenda 21 in the United Nations. And Forever Wild is, uh, is working real hard. They can get up to $15 million a year for 20 years, $300 million is what they're, they're now looking for to buy property and set it aside. But it's a lot more than that because they get matching funds from the feds. And uh, if it goes across the state line, they can do a 90-10 a match. They only have to come up with 10% of the money and the feds will furnish 90%. If it doesn't cross the state line, they get a 25-75. So they can parlay that $300 million into billions of dollars. And like in Florida's program, the Florida Forever, they've already set aside about 6 million acres in Florida that are human free and it's basically destroyed most of the agriculture in a lot of the different parts of Florida because it's it's taken out of production and it's taken out of the tax base and guess what happens if you want to maintain government they got to increase the taxes on the property that's left. So now, yeah. so now let me let me say that we have been made fun of for saying that this is part of a United, it's not a takeover. Nobody's coming in and taking anybody's property anywhere. Yeah. This, this is all an inducement to make it untenable for you to retain your property. And we, it is our contention uh, that after you look at the evidence that this is part of that program. Now I'm going to cite two documents and one newsletter published by the state of Alabama. This is what I rest my opinion on. You can just determine yourself and you can go out and look at this information if you want to. The first one is from the International Human Rights Clinic at Harvard School of Law. And it says, the title of this program is Models for Protecting the Environment for Future Generations. Future Generations, as you've already learned, is Intergenerational Equity. Now the next one is, is I think, the most telling. It comes from the Vermont Law, uh, Law School, and the title of it is Recalibrating the Law of Humans with the Law of Nature, colon, Climate Change, Human Rights, and Intergenerational Equity. Now here is what both of these articles had to say from these two law schools. It says, in the contemporary period, the concept of a trust now, if you go and look up Amendment 543 to the Alabama Constitution, that is the Forever Wild uh, Amendment, you will find in the very first section that it establishes a trust. That is what this first sentence is referring to. It is both in international and domestic law. The United Nations Framework on Convention on Climate Change holds one of the key principles is that state parties will work for the benefit of present and future generations. In U.S. law, several state constitutions have explicitly established a trusteeship. The Alabama Constitution, for instance, creates the Alabama Forever Wild Trust. So now, that's two documents written by two separate law schools contending that the Alabama Forever Wild Program is part and parcel of, of Agenda 21, and the Climate Change Treaty is one of three treaties of that Agenda 21. Now, in the back there is a handout and this is a photo of that handout. This is the action newsletter from the Alabama Cooperative Extension that ties the Alabama Forever Wild program to ecotourism and sustainable tourism and then connects that to the United Nations program. So take that and read it. On the back of that particular handout is the ballot from 1992. There was a great contention by local elected officials that the, uh, the, state of, the people in the state of Alabama wanted this program funded from now on. Not true. The ballot says that it's to be funded for 20 years. At that point, the legislature is to look at the program and determine whether or not it's to be refunded. So now there's many uh, m misconceptions that have been put out there, in my opinion, by the other side, trying to get this across and, and voted on uh, by the state legislature. Thankfully, right now, it looks like it's going to go back to the vote of the people, and we have a darn good chance uh, to educate more people about what this program is and what it actually means and why it's being uh, implemented and, and taking our... It's not tax dollars, but it's dollars that could be tax dollars because it's revenue off of the oil and gas trust from the Gulf of Mexico. So the money basically belongs to the taxpayers. And hence, you know, when we say it's taxpayer money, it, essentially it is. 
And now here is the, the uh, interval report. I've got two maps here. Uh, this is the uh, uh, state of Alabama map. You'll notice that this was taken from page 7 of uh, this interim report uh, 1992 through 2009 and the red areas are the state and federally protected areas in the state of Alabama. Now I'm going to punch the button and that is going to fade out and you're going to see the southeastern ecological framework underneath. Uh, and you'll see that we've got a good ways to go. So all of the, the, the organizations, non-governmental organizations that are pushing for this know that they want to take that money and buy this land to create what you're looking at on this map right now. Uh, next here is the, the, uh, the Coosa, Tallapoosa, and Elmore County, and Macon County, and I'll just let that fade out and you can get an idea of, of where we're going. So now let me pick up on uh, what subject? Energy. Does everybody know they have a smart meter on their house already? Yeah. Okay. Well, that's essentially what we're going to talk about. This is a survey from Alabama Power that I received in the mail. You can go uh, to Alabama Power office and, and uh, get a copy of it or get it online. Uh, they want to know how many air conditioners I have, how many people live in my house, how many screw in for us and light bulbs. Just a whole litany of uh, things that Alabama Power wants to uh, uh, wants to know. So I sent them a, a questionnaire and I asked them, I said, Mrs. Smith, she was uh, listed as the lead person or manager on this program. She said, I said, regarding Alabama Power's custom energy survey, will the information that I provide by taking the survey help in determining my household's ecological footprint? And how will the information that is collectively gathered be factored into greenhouse credits that enable Alabama Power to produce electricity sustainably? I believe that sustainable development is truly an untold story. I hope that Alabama Power can do their part in bringing this important issue to the front page of public discussion, and I sign my name. This is what she wrote back. She said, first, regarding your household's ecological footprint, your usage for the past 12 months was 11,548 kilowatts. We had to produce 6.93 metric tons of CO2 in order to give you that much electricity. She further went on and said, regarding the larger picture of sustainable energy, Alabama has several initiatives and she sent me links to go out and look at what Alabama Power is doing uh, with the sustainable electrical production. Now, in my opinion, we should have a coalition of groups that go before the Public Service Commission and make them aware of what Alabama Power is already doing. In California, part of the brownouts recently was caused because the power companies did not have carbon credits in order to operate the power plants. So we'll be facing this at some point. Now, I was in Florida not too long ago talking to a group of people, uh, and I said, imagine that if you moved down here from up north, you have a 5,000 square foot home for two people. You've got four car garage maybe, five air conditioners maybe more, I don't know. Could you imagine what your ecological footprint is and how much it would cost to produce electricity under these conditions for you to reside in a rural area in Florida? This will make it basically untenable for many people to reside in Florida or here for that matter. Now this is a newspaper article from uh, April 20th of 2010 in the UK talking about the national grid system or, or smart meter and it says the system will be able to turn on your washing machine remotely, switch off your tumble dryer and manage how and when you use your electrical energy supply. That's where we're going with this program. So now uh, we have not talked about, I'm getting close to the end, uh, this is the National Environmental Policy Act uh, it was adopted in 1970. It was voted in by a very liberal Congress. They waited for Nixon to come in in the 1970, uh, and he signed it into law. This is the very first year that we had the Earth Day celebration, very significant now. It's a global celebration of Earth Day. Uh, the National Environmental Policy Act is very short. It contains the tenets. It's a very uh, a foundational uh, piece of legislation dealing with sustainable development. Part of it says that we want to, the federal government now wants to ensure that all Americans are safe, healthful, productive, and aesthetically and culturally pleasing surroundings. So 
these would not be uh, according to your taste and your what you feel should be culturally pleasing or aesthetically pleasing. Uh, and that's why a lot of the code enforcement officers are enforcing various tenets of the building codes to ensure that it's culturally pleasing to someone, not the individual. So I thought that the National Environmental Policy Act ought to go there. This is my own personal viewpoint of a governance system. Agenda 21 is fundamental under this, so I thought that ought to go right there. The Council on Environmental Quality is the one that laid down the uh, tenets for selecting endangered species. They've been considered and labeled uh, the Council of God, if you will, because the Endangered Species Act is a religious uh, uh, document. I thought that ought to go right there. Of course, the executive branch is uh, uh, in, in handshake with all this and takes the place of the king. I don't know if you've noticed it, but the Environmental Protection Agency, and the, by the way, this is a photograph of a real badge, they have a Department of Criminal Justice uh, and Criminal Enforcement, so you actually can commit a crime against the environment. That's already written into some of the laws and home rule issues dealing with Shelby County and some of the other home rules across Alabama. I thought that ought to go there. Birmingham already has the Environmental Police Force. Uh, I thought that ought to go right there. Well, if you've already got the Environmental Police, can political code enforcement be very far behind? I thought that ought to go right there. Now, what has Congress done in all this? Said nothing. Acquiesced. So they merely become an agency under the executive branch. So that's my interpretation of the uh, global governance system that's being put in place. Now, let me, that, and this is my last slide, and we can open it up. And, and we've got much more information. If anybody wants to hang around, we'll go over it. Um, I was over 50 years old before I actually knew that the Alabama Constitution had a Bill of Rights. There are 36 rights, very explicit rights, listed in that 1901 Constitution. Now this one says, this is uh, section 35, the sole object and only legitimate end of government is to protect the citizen in the enjoyment of life, liberty, and property. And when government assumes other functions, it is usurpation and oppression. Now, most people would understand life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. But this was the phrase that John Locke wrote many, many years, years ago before the foundation of this country. And his phrase was life, liberty, and property. And the people that wrote our particular um, constitution use John Locke's phrase. Now, John uh, and uh, Thomas Jefferson came in and said, well, life and property are redundant. So he took uh, uh, life out and put in pursuit of happiness. Uh, now, I'm going to say to you that any government that would not protect the very first aspect of property, which is life, among the most innocent among us, and allow what essentially is murder, we call it abortion, but it's murder, uh, to go on. Do you really think that they'll protect your private property when it comes down to it? And thank you, Don, so You're much welcome. for coming. Yeah. I'm sorry to cut you off oh, so much. Right. No. So if you need to leave, go ahead, but otherwise stay and he'll take more questions.